Thank you, Chris. Uh, that's a long list of people, isn't it? And there have been a lot of fairly serious ones more recently. Um, I hope you know that every week you can join us in praying for those people that Chris just mentioned and others that happen. And you can see that every week on the digital bulletin, the bulletin you can find on the website that is updated weekly, as well as the weekly newsletter that goes out on Wednesday. You'll find prayers for the Covenant Life family. All of those individuals will be there. I would encourage you, um, you know, to, to lift those people up throughout the week, particularly Randy as he faces some very serious surgery on Thursday. And for Terry, who just heard this week that she was diagnosed with leukemia, my wife Barb mentioned to me just a few minutes ago before I walked up that uh, Terry and Terry are joining us via live stream at St. Mary's Hospital. We love you guys. We're praying for you. Um, so welcome to worship. Uh, maybe today is the first time you're here. Maybe it's the second because you came with someone on Easter Sunday. Uh, others of you are the faithful ones who show up every week. We are Grateful to be in God's presence this morning. If you're joining us just today, my name is Bob DeVries. I'm uh, just privileged to co-pastor along with Marshall Holtfleur here at Covenant Life. And um, we're grateful, grateful for this series, particularly that we've been in. And if you're joining us, you're coming at the very end. Um, all of us have been a part of uh, walking through the Gospel of John together since October. We've been doing this for six months. And we've come to this end of the gospel, and it feels like, to me anyway, like, like, like we're saying goodbye to a dear friend. Because as you've read and maybe reflected on John's account of Jesus' ministry, one of the things that, one of the things that you see immediately is how deliberately John keeps himself in the background of, of this gospel. Or to put it another way, how deliberately he puts Jesus in the spotlight. Because when you think of it, John could have said, you know, I was in the room. I was one of the 12. I was one of the special three. I was the only one at the cross. I ran to the tomb. But he didn't. Because Jesus' love changed John. Changed him from a disciple who at one time asked Jesus to torch some Samaritans who mocked them. And another time, along with his brother James, asked for a privileged seat in Jesus' coming kingdom. Jesus' love changed John. So that from the cross, Jesus asked John to take care of his mother Mary. Jesus' love and forgiveness and grace changed his disciples. As it does for all those who truly trust and obey him. You remember how John began his gospel, right? He said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Truly knowing Jesus changes everything changes everyone because in Jesus we can know God himself and it leads me to ask the question this morning has Jesus changed you has Jesus changed us as we've gone through this over these past six months do you find yourself viewing life through Jesus' eyes? Has it affected your priorities and plans and, and, and purposing yourself to be a follower of Jesus, knowing that doing so puts you at odds with this current culture? That's why John wrote this gospel, so that we would know Jesus for who he truly is, so that we could believe and be changed. Believe and live. You heard it last week, but these are written, said John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. Life in his name. Life, purposeful, meaningful, resurrection, life. Jesus died and rose again to bring life. 
to those seeking to more than some more than just trying to make it through one more day. Abundant life, not not the phony promise of, of, of happiness or satisfaction or recognition based upon this current culture's values. That's gone the minute you draw your last breath. Rather, life in the power of a resurrected Lord that brings new meaning and new purpose to everything you do. New meaning and new purpose to everything we do. Life that can further Jesus' mission of bringing heaven to earth, bringing the kingdom of God in the very everyday places of our lives. Resurrection life in the here and now. If, if you're like me, whenever you start reading a book, it's not too long that you're into the book and you're beginning to predict the ending. Am I right? Unless, unless you're one of those that reads the ending first. Any of those out there today? I think there's a commandment in the Old Testament about that. You, thou shalt not read the end of the book before... No. If you were reading John for the very first time, and this is what's hard for us because so many of you have read John, but if you were reading John for the very first time, what kind of an ending would you predict? With Jesus' miracles in mind, healing the lame and the blind and the sick, raising Lazarus from the dead, maybe some kind of a Netflix-type ending, right? Jesus comes out of the grave, walks into Pilate's palace and says, you know, who's king now, Roman boy? <laughs> or, he, or he walks into the temple and confronts all the religious leaders and says, you thought you killed me? Who's, I'm back. That would be epic, wouldn't it? Or, or maybe thinking about, you know, all of Jesus' powerful teaching and, and John's vivid description of the last night of his life, his trial, his crucifixion, his death and resurrection. You know, might John have the resurrected Lord now giving his disciples the, the inside scoop on what it's like to die and come back to life or, or what heaven is like or, or, or maybe what their room looked like, those rooms that he said he was preparing for them. All things that we would probably be curious about, right? But he doesn't do that either. Rather, John brings us to a beach and to a, a, a group of sad and tired fishermen and a, a guilt-ridden friend in a fireside breakfast and chat laced with forgiveness and grace. John gives us one more story about healing and restoration because that's who Jesus is. And that's why Jesus came. Because the resurrected Lord meets us in the very ordinary places of our lives. He comes to us in our homes. He joins us in our work and in, in our play. He, he meets us in our joy and in our confusion, in our guilt and in our despair, in our need for forgiveness and grace. It's what we find in John's last chapter if you haven't opened your Bibles already, do so. It's John chapter 21. We're going to look at the whole chapter. And if you can, stand in body or in spirit in honor of God's word and hear the word of the Lord. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, hmm, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. 
Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back on the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to do where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This, this was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until you return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not even the whole world would have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Have a seat. Now, while John deliberately kept himself in the background of his gospel, there was one, one disciple who was always in front, right? And you know who it is. Peter. Peter, the, the rock. He was the guy. He was the leader of the pack. He was the one who always spoke first, the one known for big boasts and promises, the last one there in the upper room before Jesus' death. Lord, I will lay my life down for you. And do you remember Jesus' reply? Will you really lay your life down for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter loved Jesus. There was no denying that. And I think he was sincere in his claim that he would lay his life down for his Savior. But around the campfire at 4 a.m., seeing Jesus bound before the religious leaders, under the pressure of staring eyes and pointing fingers, confronted by a relative of the man whose ear Peter had sliced off just hours before, he caved. He denied ever knowing Jesus, not just once, but three times, calling down curses on himself to prove his point. And 
what struck me this week as I was reading through these chapters once again was this question, where's Peter? I mean, there were people all around through all of this, right? Romans and religious leaders, other criminals, Jesus' family, John, but, but where's Peter? The only mention of Peter was on Easter morning when, when he ran to the tomb with John. John saw the grave clothes and said he believed, but Peter, he just went home. The old Peter would have been the first to greet Jesus when he appeared to the disciples that night in the upper room, wouldn't he? He would be the first to say he believed when Jesus came back a week later to clear up Thomas's doubts. But John doesn't record that Peter said anything. Were those words still ringing in his ears? I will lay my life down for you. As he played the events of that night over and over and over again. Have you been there? I mean, who of us doesn't know what it means to live with regret, with shame, or, 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 or with guilt over something that you said or, or, or did that deeply hurt or even betrayed someone you loved? Maybe you've wondered if, if you could ever be forgiven, whether your friend or, or even Jesus would look at you the same again. It makes you pull back. It makes you be quiet. It makes you suffer in silence. And the truth is, we're all like Peter. We cave too. We give in to pressure and in ways big and small deny Jesus. Because identifying yourself as a follower of Jesus today, identifying yourself as a Christian today is an increasingly risky business. And the temptation to just, you know, kind of go with the flow is pretty strong. We, we all experience failures in this life that the accuser, Satan, uses to convince us that we could never be forgiven leading to guilt and, and, and shame that can sideline a person for a lifetime. But hear this. Jesus never gives up on us. Jesus never gives up on those he knows and loves. He invites them to a meal, to breakfast on a beach. This is how John wants to end his gospel a message of grace and forgiveness and restoration that leads to new life and second chances because there is work to be done in the kingdom of God. Those days after Jesus' resurrection had to be confusing, don't you think? A confusing time for the disciples. Jesus appeared to them two times, maybe more, but now what? What's next? What do you do when life has been turned upside down? And I'm guessing a few of you have experienced that over the last two years. We tend to go back to what we're, what's familiar, right? We go back to, to what we're good at, to, to, to what makes, you know, feels like we can be successful. In, in Peter's case, he had a family to feed. He had bills to pay and taxes to pay. So he tells the others, I'm going fishing. What's interesting to me is that all the others said they would go too. They weren't shunning Peter for denying Jesus. They fully realized they all had run away too, except for John. And this is a pretty big group. Look at the text. It's Thomas and Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee. You know, that is James and John. So John himself. And then two other disciples. I'm going I'm to take a, a guess here and say one of them was Andrew, Peter's brother, and the other probably Philip, Nathaniel's friend, the one who brought him to Jesus. They go out fishing, and they get skunked. They fish all night, and it's so hot, they, they stripped off most of their clothing. I mean, can you picture it? A whole bunch of semi-naked guys on a, on a boat, throwing out the net, hauling it in. Repeat, throw out the net. Haul it in, repeat, for eight hours on a hot, dark night 
on the Sea of Galilee. These future miracle workers couldn't even coax one fish into the net. And then some guy calls out through the morning mist, friends, now you gotta know that Greek word actually can also say children, boys, have you caught anything? <laughs> Imagine their frame of mind here a minute, right? No, no, they reply. Well, how about trying the other side of the boat? Now, imagine this, you know? I mean, you're fishing on the pier on a bad day, and someone comes up and looks in your bucket, and you don't have any fish, and they say to you, have you thought about trying the other side of the pier? <laughs> what would you say? Like, buzz off, right? I mean, but they do it. Because I think they... Whether they realize it or not, there's something vaguely familiar about that command. And you know the results. And John figures it out immediately. It is the Lord. And Peter does like what the Peter we've come to know does. He throws on a, his robe and dives in the water. He, he doesn't wait. He doesn't care that the net is so full they can't pull it in. They're literally dragging it behind the boat. He throws on some clothes and swims the length of a football field to get to chore. Why? Because, because he had to see Jesus. Nothing else mattered. I think in that moment, he remembered another bad night of fishing. You read about it in Luke chapter 5, a night when, a day when Jesus had asked him to do the very same thing after a frustrating night. Put your nets in just one more time. And you know the result. It nearly swamped Peter's boat along with James and John's boat with fish. And that day, Peter fell at Jesus' feet and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But Jesus didn't leave Peter. Rather, he called Peter. And he invited this sinful man to join him in a new mission. You've been fishing for fish, but now I'm going to tell you, Peter, you're going to fish for people. Jesus didn't leave Peter then. And Jesus wouldn't leave Peter now. He was calling him. He was calling him to come. And when Peter gets there, breakfast is ready. Some fish and some freshly baked bread resting there among the coals. And Jesus even said, hey, it's a big group. Why don't you bring some of the fish you just caught? And for some reason, John tells us how many? 153. Now, as I was looking into that, there have been many who have said, you know, this is what that number means, trying to give it some spiritual or, you know, some real significance. But most likely, they just counted them up because they wanted to make sure everybody got their fair share. <laughs> These fish were to sell and make some money. They had to pay bills after all. But can you see them sitting there along that campfire, enjoying breakfast with Jesus, eating, laughing, talking. And as the meal comes to an end, as the conversation begins to die down, Jesus looks at Peter and in front of the others says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And here he is again, around a campfire like that horrible night. All the eyes trained on him. Everyone waiting for his response. Do you love me more than the others? Do you notice Jesus doesn't call him Peter? Because he isn't a rock in this moment. He's a lot more like spaghetti. The old Peter would have responded, of course I love you more than these guys. But humbled and changed, Peter says, Less, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And it's true. Jesus did know that Peter loved him. But he asks again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know. You know that I love you. And Jesus did know that Peter loved him. But he asks one more time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times. 
There's no mistaking the reason. It hurt Peter to hear it again. But Peter's threefold confession was his restoration to Jesus, to the others, to himself, knowing that he was forgiven and accepted. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus wanted Peter to know that he loved him too. That he was forgiven and an important part of Jesus' mission to the world. For how would Peter and the others show their love for Jesus? What would it mean to follow Jesus after he returns to his Father in heaven? They would lead the charge. They, they would be the ones to establish Jesus' church, to, to feed and care for his sheep. Jesus' flock, all men, women, and children who, who would come to faith by their preaching and teaching for the glory of God. And it would be costly because Jesus asks all disciples to pick up their cross and follow him. Because as I shared with you a few weeks ago, glory doesn't shine, it bleeds. And we see that as Jesus gives Peter an indication of how his own life would end. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to, to where you don't want to go. And tradition tells us that Peter was crucified. But he didn't feel himself worthy of being crucified like Jesus, so he asked to be crucified upside down. But do you notice Peter doesn't flinch? Jesus' forgiveness and restoration has set him on a new path. He, along with the others, have been entrusted with the world's greatest mission to teach and preach and call others to resurrection life in Jesus' name. But even here, you still see shades of the old Peter as he, as he sees John standing over there and says, hey, well, what about him? And Jesus' response is basically, look, Peter, you worry about you. I'll take care of the rest, which is great advice, I think, for all of us. I wonder if John ends his gospel with this story because he knew there would be a lot of other Peters in the future. Other people like us. Men and women who through the ages would say or do things that, that might lead them to think that they could never be forgiven. That they were somehow outside of Jesus' love or that Jesus could never use them. Maybe that's, maybe that's you today. And if that's true, then please hear what John once wrote to his church in one of his later letters. In fact, let's, let's read this together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen. He sends us to be his faithful presence in our homes, in our, in our work, in our schools, in our neighborhoods and community, inviting all to come to know the love that has changed us. He gives us a new reason for living, to join with each other, to feed his lambs and care for his sheep as we together work to build up the body of Christ here at Covenant Life Church. Family of Covenant Life, every one of you has an important part to play in Jesus' mission. Every one of you has a role and a spiritual gift to give. And just like Jesus' disciples on the beach that day, he invites us to join him in a meal. In a meal this morning. A meal that reminds us that we are forgiven and loved, a meal that strengthens us to be his people in the very everyday places where we live and work and play so that together with Peter, we can proclaim, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
so that we, as the family of Covenant Life Church, can believe and live. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And it struck me just this morning that he's sitting at a table with one person who would betray him, another who would deny him, others who would run away. And yet this meal was for them. It's for us. On that night he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. Given for you. Given that you may know forgiveness and Jesus' grace as he restores us to his Father in heaven. And at the end of the meal, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So that whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and our forgiveness until he comes again and we celebrate this meal with him in heaven. Friends, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you are invited to join in this meal, this sacrament that he has given us. And this morning, this morning we're going to do it like we did two years ago. For those of you who, for whom this will be a new experience, this is how it happens. As our worship team leads us with some music, you can come and gather in circles around this table, around that table over there in that wing, and that table over there. And there is one behind you if you happen to be sitting in the back through the doors in Main Street. An elder will be there to serve you, but we are actually going to serve one another. So as the elements are passed from person to person, you take a piece of bread and then you hand it to the next person and say, this is the body of Christ given for you. Hold on to the bread because then the cup will follow. You take the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Dip the bread in the cup and then pass it along with those words to the person next to you. But we realize too that some may be a little uncomfortable yet and that's perfectly okay. And if that's the case, then there are some individual things here and on that table over there. And we just welcome you to grab one of those. Friends, Jesus gave us this meal to remind us that we are forgiven and loved. As he gave his all to pay for the sins that we should have paid for. So come. Come and celebrate these means of grace with one another. Elders, if you would take your places, and when you're ready, come, for all is ready. <laughs>